dementia researcher with a blog and a rating. Does my patient understand what my research study is all about? Well, the Mental Capacity Act 2005 was developed to protect the rights of people who may lack capacity. In day-to-day life, this basically means that this legislation provides guidance about, well, should a professional be in doubt as to whether someone has decision-making capacity, how to decide this. Alongside the Mental Capacity Act Code of Practice, it provides practical examples of how to judge if a person can understand, retain, long enough to make a decision, weigh up and express a decision. Importantly for researchers, the Mental Capacity Act 2005 also provides guidance to researchers about the processes to follow when gaining consent from a research participant. Now, the Mental Capacity Act 2005 applies to the legislative regions of England and Wales. There are separate pieces of legislation for Scotland and Northern Ireland. Of course, other countries also have their own pieces of legislation. This is also important for researchers to bear in mind when they're undertaking large, multi-centre international studies. In my mind, this legislation can be considered a Bill of Rights for people who may lack capacity. Rather than allowing people to be branded with globally lacking capacity, this Act emphasises that decisions are time and decision specific. It also emphasises that people may be able to demonstrate their capacity through means other than talking in English, through other languages including signing or modalities such as gestures or writing. Unfortunately, despite this Bill of Rights, the legislation doesn't always enable increased participation in decision making. Many researchers find this legislation and the code of practice to be complicated and difficult to follow. Researchers are often not given training in this area. They're more or less expected to pick it up on the job. Very often, they aren't given any tools either to help them in consenting people to their studies. In fact, just the opposite. They're often asked to use complex, long consent forms that even they find hard to follow. How can people with communication difficulties arising from dementia, such as language difficulties or visual perceptual difficulties or attention and cognitive difficulties, even mild ones, be expected to engage with these types of forms? This means that very often people with dementia who have any difficulties in consenting are deemed as lacking capacity to consent and their relatives have to act as consultees or they're simply excluded from a study. This in turn means that lots of of, um, studies exclude anyone with a speech or language difficulty or visual or hearing impairment. It seems rather short-sighted to turn people away from a research study based on such concrete and easy-to-resolve barriers in my mind. The research states that, in general, people are most likely to fail on decision-making capacity assessments because they struggle with the understanding information. So, for starters, if only consent forms were routinely designed to be accessible by people with dementia, in fact co-designing consent forms and information sheets with patient and public involvement input seems like a bit of a no-brainer. There is more and more guidance available on this and ethics committees are slowly coming up to speed on this too. Now, secondly, surely training researchers to support people to understand information they provide would also be useful. Many of the researchers I've spoken to over the years aren't used to translating things into lay language They might not be used to drawing or using pictures or gestures to support interactions themselves. If only they had access to training and guidance on this. Our recent paper flags this issue and declares a call to arms on supporting complex and alternative consent pathways for people with communication difficulties, with fluctuating capacity and for those who already lack capacity like many of the people with dementia we work with. This feels like an important paper for the dementia field. So perhaps in your next research study, think harder about your consent processes. Find out what you could and should do in terms of supporting consent processes. Perhaps even report your consent processes more fully. Often I read a paper and nobody actually explains what they did or how they did it. If we share practices, then we can ultimately improve practice too. 
Thank you for listening. Join the Dementia Research bloggers and share your own views.